Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole Taylor, and I am privileged to serve as Pepperdine University's Chief Business Officer. Thank you for joining us this evening for the State of Freedom Around the World, a conversation with Michael Abramowitz and Kyron Skinner. The President Speaker Series welcomes distinguished scholars and thought leaders representing diverse points of view to examine topics and issues facing our communities and the world today. Driven by a desire to connect deeply with our community and to inspire meaningful dialogue in the pursuit of truth, this series provides opportunities to cultivate an engaged and impassioned collective through civil discourse. Jim Gash, Pepperdine's eighth president, will lead tonight's discussion. He will be joined by the president of Freedom House, Mike Abramowitz, and the Toby Professor of International Relations and Politics at Pepperdine School of Public Policy, Kyron Skinner. The panel discussion will be followed by a question and answer session where we will answer the questions from attendees from you. And so as the discussion continues, please add your question to the chat box. And when the question and answer session begins, we will use those questions. And without further ado, please welcome President Jim Gash. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you all for joining us today. I am eager to have this conversation with you. Since I, I met uh, Mike and we had this idea a couple months ago of chatting together, I've been looking forward to this evening for a while now. I wanna make sure that uh, you heard what Nicole said, add your questions to the chat box. So if you've got questions along the way, please add those uh, so we can get to them together at the end of the session. So let me introduce our two participants with me on this conversation. Michael J. Abramowitz is the president of Freedom House, which is a nonpartisan non voice and nonprofit dedicated to supporting democracy. There he oversees a combination of analysis, advocacy, and direct support of those who are doing the work of freedom, especially those working in closed authoritarian societies. Before coming to Freedom House, he, was, he directed the U.S. Memorial Museum's Levine Institute for Holocaust Education, and before that, he led the museum's genocide prevention efforts. He spent the first 24 years of his career, though, at the Washington Post, where he was national editor and then White House correspondent. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a media fellow at the Hoover Institution. A graduate of Harvard College, he's also a board member of the National Security Archive and a member of the Human Freedom Advisory Council for the George W. Bush Presidential Center. Dr. Kyron Skinner, one of our own, is an international relations U.S. foreign policy and political strategy expert, and as was mentioned earlier, is the Toby Professor of International Relations and Politics at Pepperdine School of Public Policy. Skinner previously, previously served as a Toby Professor for International Relations and Politics at Carnegie Mellon University's Institute for Politics and Strategy, and was a faculty member at the Department of History and Department of Social and Decision Sciences. At Carnegie Mellon, she directed the Center for International Relations and Politics and the Carnegie Mellon University Washington Semester Program. Dr. Skinner continues to serve as the W. Glenn Campbell Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution at, Hart at Stanford University. She's an award-winning and best-selling author with particular scholarship focused on the life and public policy of former President Ronald Reagan, and two of her co-authored books about President Reagan were New York Times bestsellers. So welcome, Kyron. Welcome, Mike. We're so glad that you're with us. Michael, we are thrilled that you're going to be joining our community in person in the fall, but we're thrilled to have you here with us this evening tonight to discuss what's going on with freedom in the world. Well, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, President Gash, and it's also a delight to be with my old friend Chiron Skinner, uh, who have done some events with in Washington uh, in a previous life. So it's it's really great to be here, and I can uh, I can already tell why Pepperdine is doing well, uh, given its strong leadership. So thanks for having me, Jim. Well, thank you. And, and thank you, Kyron. And Kyron's going to be jumping in regularly. We're going to be focusing a lot of this conversation on Mike's work at Freedom House, but Kyron is going to lend her vast experts, expertise in freedom to this conversation as well. So, but before we get to your work at Freedom House, Mike, let's talk for a few minutes about your work at the Washington Post and at the Holocaust Museum. So trace for us briefly your career at the Washington Post. Well, I started life 
wanted to be a journalist, and that's really all I thought I would ever want to be. And I uh, worked on the high school paper, the college paper, and then I was fortunate enough to have an internship uh, at the at the uh, at the Washington Post after I graduated, uh, and I stayed for 24 really wonderful years. I love the Post, and I say this about all my jobs. I love being a journalist. It's one of the most noble callings I think uh, in the world. Uh, uh, but and I, and I got to do a lot of really fun, cool stuff, uh, as you often get to do when you're a journalist. Uh, and then sort of, you know, about 25 years into this, I decided I wanted to try to do something different. And, you know, life is very serendipitous, Jim. And I uh, uh, was fortunate enough to kind of find myself at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., which, as many of you know, is just an incredible institution. Uh, and I was running there at the museum one of the uh, really interesting parts of the museum, which is its project on, on the prevention of genocide. At the time, it was called our Committee on Conscience. And it was really about how do you uh, help honor the victims of the Holocaust, which is really what the museum is all about, by also trying to do what you can to prevent those crimes from happening uh, to other peoples uh, in, the, in the current era. And as you know, sometimes it seems that never again is ever again. If you look at you know, the situation in, that's taken yeah. place in Rwanda or in mm -hmm. Syria, uh, the right. Rohingya in, in, in Myanmar and other places. So uh, I loved working at, I, mean, I love both those jobs. And I also love being the president of Freedom House. Yeah, well, thanks for that, that overview. And, and, and let's talk about your transition because you had this fulfilling job where you're doing incredibly important work and educating the world about as you said, never again. But then you had the opportunity to take a step into probably a little bit more expansive worldwide global leadership in freedom. What caused you to take that job? Uh, well, I Freedom House is a remarkable institution. We're 81 years old. And actually, I think there is more of a connection between uh, the work of the Holocaust Museum and Freedom House than you might normally think of at first blush. You know, Freedom House was founded uh, in the early 1940s, really before America entered the war uh, against the Nazis in Germany. And uh, what Freedom House, I think, is about, and we could talk more about it, is about, you know, promoting values of freedom and democracy. And I think one of the things that was always struck me being at the Holocaust Museum was kind of the fragility of democracy. You know, people, when they visit the Holocaust Museum, they often, you know, the, the parts of the museum that really get a lot of attention, properly so, are the shoes, you know, from the survivors, that, or, or from the victims of concentration camps, or uh, the, the model of Auschwitz, which is, you know, a very, these are really, you know, heart-wrenching heart uh, parts of the exhibit. But I also think that's a really important part of the exhibit is the beginning of the exhibition, which documents how in Germany, which in the early 30s was one of the most, was one of the most advanced democracies in the world, one of the few democracies in the world, uh, you know, was basically taken over by a, a terrible regime, which became capable of committing genocide and did commit genocide, you know, just a short period later. And so how could that happen? Uh, to me, it's a very cautionary tale about many things, but also about the fragility of democracy. And that's really what we're about at Freedom House, you know, trying to do everything we can to shore up that important governance model, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me unpack some of that. Let, let, me, let me turn to you, Kyron. Um, Mike mentioned democracy and freedom, and it seemed somewhat interchangeable, but is, is there a difference? Is, is how do those relate to each other, Kyron, in your kind of experience? Well, I'll turn to the Freedom House rankings. And so they rank freedom on a continuum. And so a democracy like the United States does not get a perfect score um, as, a, um, as a free country. So you can be a democracy and have illiberal forces. You can be lacking in freedom in many areas. And that's what I think has made the Freedom House ranking so durable, is that um, they are more nuanced. They're free and partly free and not free countries. 
and they really look deeply at what's going on in a given year in terms of civil and political rights. Um, and so to answer your question, I think it's really to use a Freedom House model, the Freedom House model. You can be a democracy with strong, illiberal and unfree um, factors and forces within your nation. And I think most leading democracies in the world um, have experienced that um, even in recent years. You know, I like, Jim, I like the, the idea that Chiron mentioned of like a continuum. But here's mm -hmm. the connection that I see uh, at, between freedom and democracy. You know, our, our ultimate aspiration uh, and hope it's probably not going to happen in our lifetimes is a world in which all people are free, in which mm -hmm. all people, you know, enjoy, you know, the blessings of liberty that enjoy the 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 things that we measure in freedom of the world, whether it's a you know freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, uh, having a strong rule of law. But the connection that I see is that, to me, democracy has proven itself to be the best system for protecting human freedom. I think it also protects other things. Uh, it's the best system for fostering prosperity, for 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 fostering peace. But I do think that it's very difficult to have freedom within governments that are not, or within societies that are ruled by non-democratic states. Uh, and you see that today in places like China and Russia and other places which are you know, authoritarian governments, uh, it's very difficult to have freedom uh, in, 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 in those types of settings. So I, I think that's what the connection we see at Freedom House. The ultimate goal is freedom, but to, and democracy is the best way of achieving it. And as Karen said, democracies can be imperfect. And I think we, we look at our own country, you know, we've had some terrible blights in our own country over our 250 year history. But but I think the thing that inspires me about being an American citizen is that, you know, we are in a perpetual effort to kind of realize the ideals that were enacted in our founding documents. Right. So freedom is the goal and democracy can be you know a vehicle. Let's talk about the work of Freedom House in in the delivery of democracy. So you mentioned that that Freedom House House is 81 years old. Tell us about how it came about. Tell, tell us the beginnings and then some of the evolution before we start getting to the actual report that you, you all put out. Sure. Well, it's, I think it's a very interesting founding story. Uh, for those of you who might have seen the Ken Burns movie uh, in the fall about the United States and the Holocaust, uh, if you remember, there was a lot, there was, especially in the, the second episode of that, there was a lot in that movie about the uh, the political battles within the United States in the late 1930s and 1940s. And to kind of simplify a very complicated story, America had become quite an isolationist country for a lot of reasons which we can unpack. But as the Nazis came to power and as the Nazis began to overrun, overturn, uh, overrun Europe, uh, America basically wanted to stay out of that war. The Gallup poll, you mentioned you're having the Gallup, the head of Gallup soon. You might ask him about this in terms of his story. But, you know, Gallup polls showed that nine out of 10 Americans did not want to get involved uh, in supporting the British uh, and the French in, in trying to hold off the Nazis. And uh, that's a, kind of a stunning fact if you look, you know, 85 years later, but it's, but it's a reality. And Freedom House uh, came together uh, and the thing that I think that's quite interesting about our founding is that we had both Republicans, Democrats, independents came, came together. Among our founding kind of patrons were Eleanor Roosevelt, who uh, was the first lady of the United States, as well as Wendell Wilkie, who had run against Eleanor's husband in 1940 for the presidency on the Republican ticket. They all came together because they believed in the basic principles of freedom and freedom of the press, freedom of speech, all the things that Freedom House cared about and still cares about. And they also recognized that the United States had to kind of get into the war against fascism because they saw a link between democracy in the United States. And they saw that the United States would not be safe in the long term if it was surrounded by uh, a lot of dictatorships. And so Freedom House really came into being to try to urge the United States to get into the war against the Nazis and to fight the isolationist streak. Over the years, after World War II, we became 
very strongly anti-communist organization. So in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, Freedom House was a very uh, visible and an, an outspoken opponent of uh, the Soviet Union, of the uh, the way that uh, that 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 operated. And then after the Berlin Wall fell uh, in 1989, Freedom House really has turned its attention to the protection uh, and the advancement of democracy, which, by the way, and we could talk more about this, we thought was going in a good direction for a while, but but has come under a lot of pressure in the last number of years. Yeah, well, we look forward to unpacking the, the various parts of the report over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes or so to see kind of what's going which direction. You mentioned a few times we at Freedom House. Tell us a little bit more about Freedom House. Who Who is, how, how big are you? Where are you located? What do you do? What are the day-to-day -day operations? What's your team look like? Sure. Great question. We're about a 250 member. We have 250 staff roughly at Freedom House. Uh, and of that staff, uh, about 150 in the United States, 100 overseas. Uh, and we're basically divided into three basic work streams. Uh, the thing that we're probably best known for is something called Freedom in the World, which is our annual assessment of uh, the state of political rights and civil liberties in every country and every territory in the world. And we've been doing that report actually uh, for. 50 years exactly. We just came out with our 50th edition of the report last week. And that report gets a lot of attention. It's quoted by politicians, by the media. And it's really to the extent that people have identified a democracy recession, it's because of the work that goes into freedom in the world. And so we do, we produce freedom of the world. We have a research team that produces other, uh, uh, other kinds of reports, uh, but we have kind of a research side, so kind of a think tank side. We also have a policy and advocacy team, which is really exists to try to uh, uh, promote human rights, uh, democratic values in the U.S. Congress, in the uh, at the United Nations, in other fora, in the executive branch of the U.S. government. And I would say that a good example of the work that we've done in that area, just to give you like one example, is Freedom House has been very involved. Uh, over the last 10 years in working with other human rights and democracy groups to persuade governments, starting with the United States, to adopt what we call the so-called Magnitsky uh, Acts, which is basically a tool by which the U.S. government and now other governments can sanction individual human rights abusers for their, uh, for their human rights violations. So rather than sanctioning whole countries, you go, you target the uh, the individuals. And I think that, uh, I think, is a very promising long-term tool for those who care about human rights and democracy. But the final thing we do, and we can certainly talk more about this, is that Freedom House uh, directly supports those fighting for freedom, primarily in authoritarian settings. We do it through a variety of different kinds of assistance, training. Uh, for instance, just to give you one example, uh, we we operate major pro program on emergency assistance, which provides emergency help for those people struggling on the front lines in uh, all over the world in 140 different countries. Uh, you, you know, you think about the coup in Myanmar uh, or the crackdown in Belarus. Uh, many of the people that have, uh, you know, we, we're we're out there trying to support those who are working on the front lines of freedom. So that's so it's so it's I we say kind of surely inform, mobilize, protect. You know, inform the public, yeah. mobilize governments and other actors and, and protect and support human rights defenders. Well, I, I know that you're out there in the field because I came across Freedom House about 10 years ago in Uganda, uh, talking to uh, the USAID in, in uh, the, the embassy in Uganda and, and them saying, you guys should really work on the work that you're doing, try to work with Freedom House. That was the first time I'd heard of them. And then when I met you at a dinner, president of Freedom House, I'm like, ah. We need to get to know each other. And so I appreciate the opportunity to do that. I'm glad you, you did mentioned that. the, yeah, me too. You mentioned the World Freedom Report. And so, as you said, that just came out. And congratulations on the 50th edition of that report. What a wealth of information, data, charts, recommendation, anybody, it's Googleable. Anybody who's out there, you should uh, take the hour and a half or so uh, to read that. Tell us about who put this together. 
you know, you, you've got this team of, of 250 or so staff members, but who put this report together and kind of what's, what's the methodology? What's behind this? How do we get to where we are each time you put out an annual report on freedom in the world? Well, thank you for asking that question. Let me just say one thing as a starter, uh, because, I'm, because I'm speaking presumably to a lot of college students, that there are, um, you know, this report is widely used on college campuses. I can't, as, as Chiron might know, whenever I speak at a college campus, you know, people in IR courses, political science courses, comparative politics courses, you know, many of them have used Freedom House reports. And by the way, Jim, you were describing the general kind of uh, overview essay, which I'll get to in a minute. But we also have very detailed country reports on each country in the world. So like if you want to know what's happening in Poland or Nigeria or Myanmar or Venezuela, you can uh, you know go online and, and look up that country and get really a wealth of information. So I'm, I'm very proud of that element of our report. But in general, just to give you like a little bit of context for what we do, uh, this report started in 1973 and it's been refined ever since, but it's basically used the same methodology where we have now roughly 25 indicators, um, uh, 10 indicators of civil, actually 10 indicators of political rights and 15 indicators of civil liberties. And uh, these indicators range from uh, uh, you know, issues like freedom of the press, freedom of expression, uh, rule of law, whether you have a free and fair election in a country. And uh, we assign a score in each of these indicators uh, and, and, and come up with a, uh, basically it, turn, it gets converted to a zero to 100 rating for each country. So you have the most free countries, according to our scores, have typically been, you know, some of the Scandinavian countries and then the least free countries, you know, at, at, at zero or around close to zero, you know, can be countries like North Korea, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia and some other countries where there's really kind of an absence of, of rights and liberties. Um, the report, it's a huge amount of work that gets into the report, that goes into the report. We have a, we have a research team of uh, about 25 to 30 people uh, uh, in New York and Washington uh, that do, uh, that all of them contribute in some fashion to this report. But then we also have about 150 or so country consultants around the world who contribute to the report. And there's a very uh, detailed methodology. Our assessments are, are, are cross-checked and double-checked and we bring in experts to kind of over, you know, to review what we're doing to make sure we're getting this right. Uh, and, and that's basically how the report gets done every year. Uh, for me, a lot of fun that I have is sometimes sitting in the uh, country review meeting. So, you know, we'll, we'll be reviewing like what's happening in Mexico or what's happening in Venezuela and to hear the kind of conversation and, you know, looking at how the, you know, how the country was doing in a particular indicator relative to the past year. Uh, you know, it's, it's an amazing process. Uh, I don't quite know, but it works. And I think it's become a very reliable tool for assessing the state of freedom around the world. And we get, uh, as I said, uh, governments pay a lot of attention to this report, which is very gratifying. Yeah, yeah. well, let me let me ask a follow up question, because the, the, the the report makes takes pains to be really careful to say we're not measuring the laws on the books in these countries, and this is, goes back to what something Kyron said earlier, it's one thing to be a democracy, it's another thing to deliver freedom. And so the report makes clear that we're talking about what actually citizens experience on the ground as opposed to what one could read in a book. Talk to us a little bit more about the difference between those two and how, how you see that in, uh, in your team's research. Well, you actually said that very well, Jim. I mean, that's exactly the idea that we are not rating governments, right? We're we're rating the uh, the, the the kind of lived experience, the experience of of people living in a particular country, uh, or in some cases, a territory. So, for instance, you know, we have a separate score for we have for for Crimea. Because it's basically occupied by the by the Russians versus uh, the rest of the Ukraine, rest of Ukraine, uh, and so uh, it's really you know how people in these individual countries, you know, what is their experience of freedom? What is their experience of political rights? Do they have uh, 
you know, the right to free to free expression and, and to also recognize that sometimes, you know, governments are not the only factor that can influence freedom, right? There can be, you know, non-state actors, terrorists, you know, who can control a territory and can and can influence freedom. So it's really, you know, it's, it's not a rating of governments, although sometimes it's interpreted that way. It's really to try to report out how people experience uh, uh, freedom in a, in a particular area. Let me, let me turn to Kyron for a second and, and ask you to consider and, and report to us the you're, the World Freedom Report is not new to you. You have been familiar with this for a while. Kind of, how do you come across it in all of the advising that you've done and all of the um, the leadership you've done, uh, both for in academia and in in uh, the the government government serves itself? How did this World Freedom Report affect uh, how you saw things? Well, um, since graduate school at Harvard, the Freedom Report's been an, um, a major part of the research and writing that I do. And I think everyone in the field, in the policy and applied world, in addition to the academic world, has looked at this index um, to um, examine the countries that they're thinking about. So it's been important in that way. And along with other um, in indicators, there's the Economic Freedom Report at the Heritage Foundation, a military um, strength report, all of these together, I think are the most important ways in which we get a window into what's happening um, in the world without having ourselves to um, do original research on each and every country. I will say that I've heard, and I don't know if this is the case with, um, with Freedom House, but many um, key political actors in countries around the world try to cozy up to their um, rankers. And so they try to game it a bit. I'm really interested in, and fascinated by that, that fact. And I've watched some of that happen with some of the other um, reports that I've just mentioned. Um, I'm interested, Michael, since you have this dimension, which is unique among um, the um, indicator reports that exist, in Washington, you have people out in the field who are doing a kind of advocacy behind authoritarian lines, so to speak. Do you see this kind of attempt to game the system or cozy up to the officials of Freedom House to get a better score, even though as you've made it clear, you're not ranking governments? Right. You know, it's a good question, Kyron. Let me just say one thing that I wanted to emphasize, and then I'll try to deal with your question, but your but the conversation is making me think of one other point. You know, one of the kinds of criticisms that we often that we occasionally get, I wouldn't say often, is that we're kind of a US, you know, uh centric organization that we're looking at things, you know, from the point of view of like the US. Uh and you know, a lot of our funding comes from donors in the US as well. I really think that over like one thing that I've been really struck by since being the president of Freedom House is you know how much input goes into the report from people you know outside of the US you know and we you know a lot of our analysts are non US citizens uh they have interesting perspectives on things and we and by the way we also you know rate the US or or look at freedom within the US so you know unlike for instance the the US state department which has you know, these country human rights reports every year, but they don't look at the U.S., you know, we do look at the U.S. And I think that, by the way, that's both a source of occasional con controversy, uh, but it's also a source of, I think, of strength, because, you know, if, if the if the leader of an authoritarian country or even a backsliding democracy comes at us and says, hey, you know, you guys are just the U.S. and that, that's, you know, I said, no, no, we also look at the U.S., you know, with the same uh, standards that we do. You know, I find Tyron, that the uh, the freest countries in the world, the ones that scores, you know, in the '90s, you know, they're 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 proud of the free the Freedom House designation, but they don't really, you know, pay, you know, they're happy to have it. And I would say the the least free countries, you know, don't really care. But I think I think where where we have some sort of salience is among kind of these partly free countries, that middle, but often of countries that are trying to do better. But and but don't get better. And I think one of the reasons why they care about our scores is that in some cases, 
you know, development assistance is kind of conditioned on these countries doing well in the uh, in the scores. Uh, so, for instance, during the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, you know, President Bush worked with Congress to set up this Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is, uh, you know, provides, you know, kind of concentrated development assistance to certain countries that meet certain standards. But but by but by definition, you know, those standards have to do with uh, uh, democracy. And so, the, you know, the, the, you can't qualify for a grant from the MCC unless you do well in certain Freedom House indicators, which is something that uh, is, um, I think is great. I think uh, uh, is exactly the way we want this our product to be used. Excellent. Well, let's let's delve a little bit more deeply. And I, I love the term you use. I've never heard it before. A freedom recession, you know, a dropping of freedom. And so we see, you know, your your ten categories of political rights, your fifteen categories of civil liberties, zero to four four point scale, a hundred possible points. We've had. So this last report had three that got a perfect score, Sweden, right. Finland, and Norway, New Zealand with a 99, Canada with a 98, and five countries with a 97. And yet the U.S. is not among those. In fact, the U.S. isn't even in the 90s. We've gone from 89 in 2017 to 86 in 2018 to 83 in 2021, and we're still at 83. Talk to us about why there's a comparatively lower score in the U.S., for example, than in Canada or these other places. What is it that the U.S. is losing points on? Well, let me say, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say a word, if I could, Jim, just about the democracy recession which you yeah. alluded to, because I want to explain that. And then I can sort of talk about how the U.S. fits into that. Because I think I think sometimes we often think of the U.S. as unique, but I think what's happening in the U.S. is to some extent reflective of some broader trends that are happening uh, perhaps in other parts of the world. But uh, the, the democracy recession is actually a phrase that was coined by Larry Diamond, who's a democracy scholar uh, at the Hoover Institute and at Stanford, a uh, really smart guy. Uh, uh, and uh, had been involved with the Journal for Democracy for many years. And what it really refers to is that really over the last 17 years, uh, the general trend, according to the Freedom House scores, has been countries have been, uh, there have been more countries who have suffered declines in rights and liberties than those that have had improvements. And some years, it's been quite stark, the difference. So last year, for instance, you had 60 countries, not, not 2021, sorry, you had 60 countries uh, that had uh, declines and only 25 that had improvements. And so that has been a general trend over the last 17, 17 years. That's what people refer to as a democracy recession. Now, we, we, ha we have some evidence that that might be turning around this year. We don't know for sure. But I think the U.S., like a number of other major democracies, India would be another example, uh, Poland, Hungary, a number of other kind of democracies have have suffered. And I think one of the points, Jim, that we often make at Freedom House, and I think you it's captured in the scores, is that, you know, the presence of having free elections is not enough to be a strong democracy. You have to have a strong, you know, free press to hold the government to account. You have to have a strong rule of law uh, so that, you know, people, you know, people can know that their their rights are going to be uh, respected and, and, and treated equally. Uh, uh, you have to have transparency. Uh, you know, one of the things we look at is making sure that governments have safeguards against corruption, because one of the kind of things that's been difficult for many democracies. So what you see, what you've seen, and the United States is no, is not, a, is no different than a few other countries. You've had uh, the United States slipping in some of these other areas, even though I would argue that, you know, by and large, you know, despite the claims of some people that the, that the elections in America have been largely free and fair uh, in recent years. But it's really looking at some of these other things uh, that, that, that caused the U.S. to be declined. How, how did, um, if at all, did the pandemic play into your, um, your assessment on some of these scores? Did, did, did the, the curtailment of certain freedoms, was that ca calculated into the score or was yes. that just- yeah, I, I would say actually- the, the 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 pandemic had a very uh was kind of an accelerant if you will of some of these broader trends and by the way i'm not talking about 
you know, to things like, you know, requiring people to wear masks or things, you know, that you can have an argument about that. But I'm actually talking about, you know, much more, you know, situations like in, in Hungary, where the prime minister, you know, seized emergency powers uh, that went really far beyond what was required uh, to handle the, the health epidemic. And you saw that kind of thing happening all over the world. And so actually some of those, you know, you saw restrictions on, on protests uh, that were kind of named in, you know, enacted in the name of uh, 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 addressing the pandemic. Uh, you had uh, uh, efforts made to prevent critique of government, you know, so-called fake news, uh, 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 you know, to kind of in, in the name of public health. So I, I think that, that, I think the pandemic was really and we actually did a special report one year because we saw it happening that really looked at, I think, three years, you know, the first year of the pandemic, we looked at, at that trend. Now, what you see now is some of those pandemic era restrictions being loosened. And I think that's responsible for some improvements in, in, in certain countries now. Yeah, you, you mentioned that this, we may be at an inflection point. We had 34 countries that uh, that improved, 35 that, that didn't improve or, or declined. Um, perhaps some of that related to uh, coming out of the pandemic. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes, I think that 2022 was a really interesting year. So by the way, the 2023 report, which came out last week, is really a look backwards at 2022. Right. And so you know, it, it covers what happened in, in, in that year. And I think that what happened, it, it, uh, I think 2022 was actually had some hope. Uh, again, I, th I think you start with the situation in Ukraine. Uh, a year ago, now Ukraine did suffer some declines uh, in freedom in 2022, but not really because of anything that the Ukraine people did because the country was invaded by the Russians. And so right. that is something that, but, 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 but I think the fact that the people of Ukraine really rallied to the defense of the country and, and, to, the, and to the kind of struggling democracy there, I think was a very hopeful sign uh, in 2022. I think another thing that I would say, not yet quite reflect in the scores, but I think the level of protests that happened, for instance, in Iran, which is one of the most repressive countries in the world, had really kind of an amazing women-led movement uh, to protest really the quite outrageous repression that's perpetrated by the uh, by the Islamic State there. And my perspective, I'm not an Iran expert, but I've spent a lot of time in the last few months talking to people about this. I think that, that what happened in Iran really demonstrates, number one, that the regime there has really lost the consent of the government to the extent that it ever had it. But I think you know that regime is really uh, exercises you know, rules by force and repression alone and has lost any sense of kind of the, the, the confidence of the people. Uh, and uh, so I just think that the fact that people still are demanding freedom, you saw that in Hong Kong, you saw that in places like Belarus, Russia, where there have been protests, even China, by the way, one of the most repressive societies in the world, there were these COVID-19 protests that, that forced the government in China to back off. So that's the kind of hope, that, that's the kind of development that really gives me a lot of hope uh, for the future of freedom because people want to live in freedom. They don't want to live in, in an autocracy. Exactly. Kyron, where are you seeing, if anywhere, additional signs of hope in, in the comeback of democracy or the comeback of freedom? Well, I think the Ukraine war, President Gash, that you've already mentioned is um, an example. And what I mean in particular is that I think there was a way in which one could see the democratic West as having stalled for a while in terms of not just the number of the scores of individual nations in that grouping who are in the fully free category, but in terms of energy, creativity, enthusiasm for being in this club, um, the Ukraine war has done something that no one could have anticipated 12 months ago. Um, including, I think, our great scholars at Freedom House. You've got two high North countries now en route to joining NATO that had stayed neutral, um, but now they have decided their own parliaments, their own populations, that Finland and Sweden, they want to be part of this club. 
Um, by the way, they are just um, nearby um, the new Pepperdine campus in Vevey, Switzerland. So um, we hope to do some meetings with them in the future. You've seen countries in Central Europe show enormous courage, the Baltic states, um, the, a discussion in the EU about having um, Moldova and Ukraine in membership. Um, we just see a different, I think, Western alliance than we did a year ago. And so I don't know if that will reserve, result in um, better freedom scores for those countries, but I feel like democracy is on the move again. It, it has a purpose um, and a direction that wasn't gone away completely, but now is acting in a more, I think, intentional um, direction. And that's especially in the transatlantic community. Amen. You know, and maybe one thing, so. Jim, that I would add that's sort of interesting is the, you know, it's interesting that the Ukraine war, I think it's been quite remarkable, the kind of level of support, uh, particularly in the United States and Western Europe for the Ukraine war efforts. I think people recognize what's at stake. I mean, obviously there's been some divisions in our own country about that. And there are parts of both parties that are uh, are not as supportive of that. But I think by and large, you know, there's a consensus so far uh, to stay the course on Ukraine. And, and, and actually one of our major recommendations in Freedom of the World uh, last week was that we really see the war in Ukraine as part of this, you know, freedom struggle and that it's important for Ukraine to win. However, this, war is not being the same way, seen the same way in other parts of the world. Uh, you think about India, uh, you think about South Africa, a number of other really very important countries, uh, you know, don't necessarily see things the way that uh, people in Washington or, or London or, or Berlin have seen it. I think there's some reasons for that, but I, but I think we should not be under any illusion that this is an unalloyed, like everyone is for this war. I think there are significant parts of the global community that have some doubts about whether this is the right course and would and would rather see, uh, uh, you know, much stronger efforts to make peace right now. I think, I mean, we all want peace, but I think that if it's, 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 I think that that kind of view is misguided. But I think we have to recognize that it's there. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me let me uh, since we're in an academic environment, at least. I'm in an academic environment and I'm inviting you into the academic community of Pepperdine through this conversation. Let's talk a little bit about academic freedom, a different kind of freedom that isn't always associated in the same way with the kind of democracy and freedom we're talking about. But as, as those of us who are in education and think about this a lot, it's a critically important part of democracy and of freedom is, is to be able to have this academic freedom. How, if, if at all, does academic freedom in a country play out or, or manifest itself in your scores? Well, well, academic freedom is an indicator uh, in, our, in our scores. It's something we've looked at. Um, uh, we, looked at we look at every year. Uh, the basic question that we ask is, in a particular country, is, is there academic freedom? And is the educational system free from extensive political indoctrination? And I think it's interesting. We've seen problems around the world uh, with academic freedom. This is, or with attacks on academic freedom. I think uh, my team told me that there were six countries that uh, experienced declines in, in academic freedom last year uh, compared to only two countries that saw improvements. And, you know, some of the countries you know why this is happening. You know, Afghanistan, where the Taliban took over and has extensively curtailed uh, academic freedoms, you know, censored books, you know, prevented women from attending college. Uh, and then also uh, in Ukraine, uh, academic freedom declined because the Russian authorities, uh, once they took over parts of the country, you know, forcibly changed the curriculums and threatened and, and threatened local educators to kind of tow the the Russian line uh, uh, on how to teach certain subjects. So this is a global phenomenon. And we, we, we're also, I think, I'm, I'm guessing that you want to get to the United States, but we've been concerned about uh, the level of academic freedom, the, the attacks on academic freedom 
in the United States. Uh, and, you know, honestly, the two of you may be better judges of what's going on. Uh, my sense is that there are, there are attacks on academic freedom that are coming from both right and left. You can have a, a long debate about who is more responsible for that. But I've seen, I've seen, you know, as, you know, all too many cases of kind of conservative experts or speakers being kind of essentially shouted down at, uh, at on certain campuses, but we've also seen on other campuses or in other parts, you know, conservative governors, uh, Republican governors, uh, you know, taking efforts to uh, try to tell people things that can teach or can't teach. So I, I see problems on both sides. Uh, I, I know you're going to press me on, on, on who's worse. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm not. No, gonna, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'll, but, 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 but I truly, you know, I, I, I think, I, I, I think it's wrong either way. And I think we need to kind of resist, uh, you know, I, I, we, tr you know, part of a democracy is having a free academic, right. Having a free academic sphere where professors and students can 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 pursue knowledge uh, uh, and and pursue their their interest freely you know without intimidation or indoctrination yeah let me invite dr skinner into this conversation let me add a a, a wrinkle to this as well um, comment on if you would academic freedom the state of academic freedom in the country but also w whether um, viewpoint diversity plays a role and how what role it plays and how we're doing in that uh, category Kyron oh, oh you're on mute still okay academic freedom from the standpoint of the academy what's going on in universities I would hope that the Freedom House team is really looking at what's happening in the academy because I think these are incredibly challenging times. Most institutions are struggling to get it right. Um, I think there are very few people that would say who are in these institutions that we have enough um, intellectual and ideological balance in conversations um, in the classroom, in terms of faculty appointments, I don't think that we will stay um, the kind of predominant actor in, in higher education that we've been really since World War II if we don't find um, a better conversation within the university. Not that it has to be conservative or liberal, but one that's open to a range of intellectual ideas. Um, this idea of viewpoint diversity, that's not my favorite term, but I know what one is getting at when one mentions it. I think it's hard to, to see where it's um, being allowed in many of our institutions. Um, and, you know, there's I won't say that there's a backlash because I think that there's been a march against certain ideas and certain types of scholars and people for quite some time. Um, and I do think it is leading to, in my view, what I consider the biggest national security problem for the United States. And I've said it many times, I'm on record, and it's K through 16. It's the inability for us to have a non-biased conversation um, in the classroom and really return to kind of first principles in education. So that's about wow, as well, diplomatic as I can say it. And um, I do mean it. I believe in the university. I believe in American education. It has changed the world, um, but it's facing its own internal struggle. And it, that struggle is quite profound. Well, one of my former bosses used to say that the, the 11th commandment is thou shalt not speak ill of another university. And I will I will abide by that, that, um, that, advice but to say that what we what we see on a regular basis increasingly so is just um it's, it's hard to say anything other than just outrageous stifling of speech uh because of its content don't like what you have to say therefore i'm going to keep you from from hearing it and it's happening increasingly on college campuses uh we, we just had an incident up a place sometimes known as the farm up, up north. We have one in, in, uh, in 
um, New Haven. See, I didn't say this, the name of the school, but where, where this, they, they get the, 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 the capture the attention of the public for, for just complete unwillingness to allow people to say things with which you disagree. I would imagine, Mike, that that's, that catches the attention of those who are doing the rankings on, because it's not a state actor, not usually, yeah. perhaps not often a state actor, but yet the, the participants uh, in the, the hope for dialogue are still being denied the opportunity to have a robust discussion about politically charged matters. Right. You know, let me just say one quick thing on that, Jim. And I think, look, I, from a personal point of view, I think that I'm not sure what their best way of saying it, but let's just say viewpoint diversity is is really an important thing. I think, you know, I think society would be better if institutions, you know, reflected, you know, a greater diversity of political opinion than sometimes institutions have. So I, I kind of agree with that point. That's not actually the issue that we measure at Freedom House. You know, we're looking at, you know, for instance, you know, our university faculty, you know, having harassment or professional repercussions, you know, because they say certain things in a classroom or say things on social media or are, you know, students obstructing, you know, certain speakers from, from speaking, uh, you know, because they don't like uh, their views or the content of the, of the speech. That's sort of what we're looking at at Freedom House. And it's hard, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to, uh, you know, make a generalization, but I, but I certainly feel like our experience from looking around the world is that that kind of academic freedom is, is under pressure, you know, around mm -hmm. the world. Well, what, what we'll do in the, in the last five or seven minutes before we turn it over to the audience for questions is do some rapid fire on the recommendations in your report. And so uh, you, you close the report with five recommendations, one of which uh, we've talked a little bit about. And, and the first one is help Ukraine win. Right. And so you, you've, you've explained what that means. You know, the, the democracy needs to prevail. And right now there's it's under attack in, in, in that region. Again, whatever one thinks about the amount of money that should be spent doing what. Well, I really, but, uh, I, I really believe that that's important because, you know, Ukraine, I, I truly believe that one of the reasons that Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine is because he couldn't stomach the presence of a, you know, of, of a democracy uh, on mm -hmm. his border. I mean, there could be other reasons too, but I think it, it's, you know, Ukraine was standing there as a, I mean, again, it was not a perfect democracy. I think uh, it, it was not one of those countries like <laughs> had close to 100 ratings and a lot of problems with things like corruption, but I think they were trying to do better. And especially mm -hmm. since 2014 had been on a good upward path. And so I, I do think that's Ukraine is a very important story uh, for the story right. of global democracy. Yeah, so let me hit the, the four remaining and then maybe you, you give uh, some thoughts and then Kyron give us some thoughts. Uh, number two was stop enabling authoritarians. Tell us about what that means. Well, that really addresses the fact that uh, a lot of the authoritarian countries uh, are basically taking advantage of the openness of the kind of Western democratic financial system to park their ill-gotten gains, right? So you think about the way London was up until relatively recently, where you know a lot of the Russian oligarchs would kind of plundered the... Uh, Russian state resources and really helped enable Putin were able to park a lot of their resources in banks and they were protected by law firms in London. So I think that's what we mean, that we have to sort of make a stronger effort to uh, make it difficult for authoritarians to do their business. Excellent. Kyron, any, uh, any additional thoughts there? Yes, on the Ukraine one, I think, you know, I understand the viewpoint that um, many around the globe, not all, want Ukraine to win, to be whole and free and democratic. But I also think we have to remember what the Ukrainian government has been highly corrupt. Um, and there's a lot of discussion now about starting reconstruction or getting ready for reconstruction in that country. When you have a highly corrupt nation over many, many years with various regimes. Um, and you talk about reconstruction, that is a cocktail for more corruption. 
Um, so that's something I think to understand the nation we're talking about. Also, the fact that the United States is paying for probably 60% or more of the military aid or providing to Ukraine, I'd like to see um, um, other nations who are in this fight um, step up. Their response is that the EU is doing the lion's share of the humanitarian um, assistance, but the U.S. is right there as well. It always is. This can't be a U.S. fight. And the American public is really divided on this point. So I think we need to get sharper about what the national interest is for the United States in this particular war. It can't just be, we want it, um, to defend a democracy, then we need to be in about 20 other wars um, you know, very aggressively. So I think we've yet to really define why this is the fight of our time. We have some ideas about it. Um, on the issue about stop enabling um, authoritarian regimes, I, I agree. I think the main way to do that is to have a rigorous, rigorous human rights regime in place um, coming out of our State Department. That really hasn't happened um, since the Reagan administration, to be, to be really frank and clear, um, and one that it's really well known. And, you know, the China and the Uyghurs um, should be a major daily discussion coming out of press rooms. And, you know, look at what China's doing now, brokering this new entente between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Three kind of bad actors coming together with the U.S. not being at the center of the conversation. That's what unfreedom looks like in the world. Wow. Okay, there you have it. The, the, uh, let's, let's go to the third one. Uh, be clear and unapologetic about the virtues of democracy and tireless in efforts to uphold and defend it. Is that more of a, Mike, uh, defend Ukraine, come to their aid, or is, or is there more to that? I think, I, think, I think what we had in mind there is that I think one thing that we have seen over the last 10 to 15 years is that authoritarian countries, particularly China, you know, making a much stronger case that their form of government is the best, uh, that, that, you know, they're bringing stability, they're bringing order. Uh, and, they're, and I think under President Xi, China is trying to kind of advertise itself to the developing world as another model of development that might be good for you. And I think the point I would say is I think democracies, including the United States, but others as well, have to be equally aggressive kind of in the kind of public diplomacy piece of this and really make the case that, as I said, that democracy is a system that best protects freedom, that best promotes prosperity, and that also, I think in the long term, you know, democracies don't go to war with each other. I think, you know, Professor Skinner will tell you that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, evidence about that in, in, in academia. And so I do think that we have to really be strong about the case of, of democracy. Excellent. Kyron, let, let, let me give you the last word before we get to the audience questions. Uh, he, he pitched that one to you. Democracies don't go to, to war against each other. Talk to us about that. Is, is, is that um, historically uh, fully defensible or, or what's your thought about that? Not really. Um, you know, democracies for the most part don't fight each other, but democracy has been so rare in world history. Um, and there have been times when um, the world was marked by undemocratic um, leadership and they weren't and those nations weren't always at war with each other. So I, I don't think we have a large enough in to make that proposition. But even when in the world that we have seen and um, since um, the 20th century, democracies have fought each other. In some ways, one could say that World War I and World War II, the most devastating wars in world history were fights between and among democracies. Um, other smaller nations have had um, um, fights as well in the um, Ecuador and Peru fought in 1995. Um, so I think this is a, a position of the democratic peace that has had some poisonous effects in Washington. Um, and so I'm concerned about this idea of just spreading democracy and you will get universally salubrious outcomes. I doubt that's the case. Mike, let me let me invite you to to uh, well, to, to well, look. First, first of all, I think there's I think there's exceptions to the rules, I, and I think certainly democracies, and in my lifetime, have made 
some very serious mistakes. And and I'm not actually advocating, you know, willy nilly, you know, invading other countries. You know, we, I really am not. All I'm saying, though, is that I think that as a form of government, democracy is better than the alternative, and we have to be uh, forceful in that. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have to go invade other countries. And by the way, the Ukrainians are fighting for themselves. They're, you know, they're you know we're, we're giving them the arms, uh, but they're fighting for themselves. Uh, so you know that's not a situation where the U.S. is trying to you know fight for them or that NATO is coming to fight for them. It would be an interesting. No, but we're spending a lot of money. If you don't mind, if I do a two finger here, we're spending a lot of money, and we're getting closer and closer to the ground zero of the world with training forces, um, with the types of weapons that we're giving. I mean, we we are creeping in um, to this conflict the way we did in World War II when there was aid short of war, um, and then it kept going, and then all of a sudden. Um, even without Pearl Harbor, we were basically in war. So I think we have to be very careful. And we are carrying a huge financial burden compared to the others in the Democratic West. I just think we have to face that. Um, you know, not to put a plug in for Donald Trump or the Trump administration, but Trump cared less about regime type in the world and more about American strength. And we didn't have some of these conflicts that we now have when the focus wasn't on is this a de democracy or you know what's happening between these two countries when it, uh, the US is very clear about its direction and purpose backed with strength often nations that are less democratic or the putins of the world they don't do all of the bad things they'd like to do i wonder if we'd be in this war if we'd had the kind of trump doctrine policy in place right now i think it's something that's worth being debated, whether you like Trump or not. The ideas seem to have kept at bay some of the worst um, tendencies of authoritarian leaders. Yeah, I don't know necessarily if I agree with you, but I do think that if if Trump had been president and Putin had gone into Ukraine the way he did, I, I'm not sure that, you know, <laughs> the Ukraine would still be fighting. Uh, so... Whether he would have deterred Russia is another question. I don't know. Well, there you have it, folks. That's what we call civil discourse here at Pepperdine. People who respectfully and from a, a standpoint of intellect and data and evidence make arguments. I think, uh, let, 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 me, let me throw out a challenge, uh, Mike, if you would, maybe an empirical question, because there's three different categories. There's free, partly free, and not free. I wonder if empirically free countries have really actually gone to war versus partly free and 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 uh, or, or not free over the last you know decades. It'd be interesting to see. But what we want to do now is to uh, invite Nicole Taylor, who's going to come back and and uh, throw some of the questions we've had pouring into the chat box from our audience, and we'll do that for the next ten minutes, maybe twelve minutes or so. So let me invite Nicole to ask the first question. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's such an engaging conversation. And many of the folks following us are following along and asking similar questions to what you all raised. So this is great. One of the things that people are curious about is um, democracy is said many times in the Freedom Report to be the best, having the best record for protecting human rights or leading to freedom. Is is the comment then that democracy is the only way to get there? Or are there other forms of government that can get us there? And if so, what else has to be present in the country to get us to freedom in those areas? We'll start with you, Mike. You know, it's a good question. Like I would never say, I, I don't know of another, I mean, I, maybe Chiron can help us think that through this. I, I, I mean, I, honestly, I don't think their, you know, basic human rights or civil liberties are are safe, uh, other than in, in a democracy, are fully safe. Now, it's true that there are some countries, and people cite Singapore as an example, that you know, you know, protect, you know, certain rights, uh, and um, you know, we are. Uh, you know, for instance, you know, people have said that Singapore has a very strong rule of law. Uh, but I do think that, you know, the countries that are in the free categories for us are for the most part democracies, and they're the ones that have the strongest record on on, on rights and freedom. So I, I truly do believe in my heart that democracy 
uh, is the best system for protecting those rights. Although you can find, you know, some alternative cases. I mean, I do think that, you know, one of the big challenges in the world today is is China, which I do think is a major threat to freedom. By the way, not just inside China, but I think increasingly China is, you know, compared to its policies in the 1970s and 80s, where it's more inward looking, is really, you know, trying to, ex, you know, export some of its uh, tactics to other countries. Uh, uh, you know, they're trying to be more active in the UN setting. So uh, I do think that I, I do believe. I mean, I probably wouldn't be the president of Freedom House if I if I if I if I, if I believed otherwise. But I but I, and we've been having this discussion. I do I do believe that democracy is the best system for protecting those rights and liberties that we hold dear. Which is not to say that it can't occasionally happen in other places, but I don't think so in the long term. Cameron, I I agree. I mean, I'm so pleased that I'm living in the United States and in, in a democracy. I'm a little upset that we're at number 83 um, on the scale. I don't, I want to understand why we're not the leader. Um, and I, I would kind of like to turn my answer into a question to our guest. And that is, I typically say the United States is the most fully functioning multi-ethnic democracy in the world. Am I wrong? I've been saying that for years given that the U.S. is at the 83rd place for two years now and Freedom House ranking. We're not in the 83rd place. But we have the United points. States has a score of 80, 80. 83 points. But I would say the U.S. does. Look, on a global scale, I always say this. The U.S. is a very strong democracy. And actually, Chiron, what you just said, actually, I think we would find some common agreement on. I think, you know, countries like Sweden, Sweden, Finland, you know, they've done well in our scores historically, but they're kind of, right. you know, they're not the kind of multi-ethnic diverse, you know, communities that, that we have in the United States. Uh, uh, now, sometimes th things are changing a bit in Europe, but I think, I think your point is well, I think the United States is, uh, I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're not perfect, but we're, but we're moving, you know, we're, you know, historically we're, we've been trying to move in a good direction. And I think that's something to be said for that, 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 you know, I think, you know, the greatest thing about the United States is like the ideals in our, in our founding documents, and we don't always live up to them. And, you know, in very, in, in a major way, you know, witness slavery and Jim Crow and all the other terrible things that have happened over the years, but we're in a process of, 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 of continual uh, improvement of an aspiration to live up to those founding ideals. And that's, uh, that's what I think is great about our country. Yeah. Excellent. And Nicole, second question. I think we have time for two more questions. Okay, great. Relatedly, you mentioned China, and some folks were wondering, uh, with the recent establishment or reestablishment of diplomatic relations with China and countries like Iran or Saudi Arabia, should we be concerned about those alliances, mainly from a human rights perspective, especially given what you were discussing about Iranian women's rights progress? And then if yes, how do we make democracy more attractive to countries so they aren't seeking alliances with communist-led countries like China? It's a great question. In some ways, I'd be curious what Professor Skinner thinks on, on the recent kind of rapprochement brokered by China of Saudi Arabia and Iran. I think mm -hmm. uh, that has potential, you know, that has put, I mean, that has potential maybe bad news for the United States uh, down the road. Uh, but remember, these these three countries that are at stake are, are among the least free countries in the world. They don't care about the political rights and civil liberties of the people who live within those countries. Certainly the Iranian regime does not, the Saudi regime does not, and the Chinese regime does not. And so the fact that they're working together uh, is, is, is uh, of concern, but not totally surprising. Uh, and I think what's really important is that you know, democracies have to come to the support of each other. Yeah, um, on that point, I think, you know, unimaginable two years ago that these three countries would be coming together with China brokering the deal. Um, the Abraham Accords instead should have been expanding. And that was the trajectory we were on when we weren't focusing on regime type in the conversation coming out of the White House. But in fact, can we find some commonalities among countries that have been 
you know, basically at not exactly at war, but you know, at in a very hostile environment with each other for a long time. I think American leadership, when it's not there, others step in. And I think this is an example where we are not providing the US, when I say we, leadership in the broader Middle East. And this, and so you have it. Um, and again, when we were most of the time when we've successfully provided leadership in the Middle East and you know gotten big outcomes like um, Menachem Begin and the um, peace deal that Jimmy Carter, the first peace deal with an Arab country and Israel, it's when we've not focused on regime type, but trying to find common interests, which ultimately will make those countries a lot more free or freer. Excellent. Last question, Nicole. Okay, there are lots of folks who are thinking about what are the biggest threats to freedom and one that several have just commented on, maybe you could comment on as well. Do you see the rise of artificial intelligence as a threat to democracy worldwide? And if so, why is that? Ooh, tough question. Karen, <laughs> do you want to start with that one? Um, I always err on the side of, of technology, and I think that for all of its problems, it does give us a lot more information. I think what is underneath that question about AI is that you can get more kind of command um, behavior and outcomes. I think that's what um, the, the person asking the question is trying to say. Um, that's always going to happen when you bring technology into the democratic mi mix, but there's no other way. And so I think to try to use AI for more democratic purposes, I think we need to be more intentional. I think we need to study that very issue at Pepperdine. Um, and, um, and you don't have to be the leading STEM university to kind of think through these questions. Many of them are social science questions. Um, I think we have to live with it and work. It's not going away. Great, well, Mike. Let, let me just sort of make a general point about technology. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to have a good answer for you specific on AI, but let me just say that I think, and we haven't really talked about it too much tonight, but I do think that technology issues and how we handle them are absolutely crucial in general to the future of, of democracy. I mean, we really haven't talked about social media, uh, and there's a whole debate that could be had about the role social media has had in undermining, you know, trust in institutions uh, and so forth. I think what's interesting to me from kind of a human rights and democracy perspective is I think when some of these new technologies really came online, you know, 15, 20 years ago, social media in particular, the, the big platforms, I think there was a bit of a, uh, looking for the right word here, a, a bit of a um, kind of Pollyannish feeling about what this all meant. Uh, you know, we we all thought, that technology was going to usher in, you know, a realm of freedom, unprecedented human history. You, you think about Tahir Square and the role that Facebook had in helping facilitate the revolution in, in Egypt. And I think there was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, unsupported optimism about where things are going. And, and of course, one of the trends that we've seen at Freedom House over the last 10 years, and by the way, we also do another report, which I highly recommend called Freedom on the Net, which looks at online freedom. And one of the issues that's been really well documented in that report over the last you know, five to 10 years is the fact that uh, authoritarian countries have been much more successful in kind of controlling their own internets, keeping their people from getting it, you know, good information, uh, you know, being able to you know, weaponize social media against their adversaries. And so I think there's some very profound issues that are uh, uh, that there are some very profound issues that are raised by by technology that 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 I think are going to be grappled with for those who really care about democracy. It's not an unalloyed good or or an unalloyed bad for that matter, but it's just something that's going to have to be managed and pushed in a, and nurtured in a good direction. Well, thank you both. What a what a rich conversation we've had. Uh, thank you for lending your insight. Your expertise, your um, candor, and and feeling free to, to disagree with each other on important things. And this is the kind of thing that we want to do. And we're going to be doing this again, April 10th. Mark your calendars on April 10th in Malibu. 
live in person and simulcast over the uh, the internet in this same format. We'll have the CEO of Gallup, John Clifton, here talking about his most recent book called Blind Spot: The Global Rise of Unhappiness and How Leaders Missed It. April tenth, next next edition of the President Speaker Series. What a what a great evening for all of us. Thank you for joining us, and look forward to seeing you both here in the near near future. It's great to be Us with everyone. You, and great to be with you, Chiron. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have both. a great evening. Bye bye. God bless you all.